Okay, so this is quite a new module, so uh, I erred on the side of having uh, more content. Uh, so I'm going to go through it quite quickly and uh, feel free to stop me uh, if anything is not well presented or if you're misunderstanding something. Okay, so we're what we're going to try and learn in this uh, module is the impact of gene fusions in cancer, uh, the different types of evidence we can uh, use to identify gene fusions. We're going to try and understand the, the available detection methods and tools and the basis for these methods. Uh, we're going to look at how we can identify common sources of false positives. And then we're going to try and uh, have some understanding of the, the potential function of these fusions. Just to begin with a quick definition, and, uh, fug uh, gene fusion is a novel gene formed by a fusion of two distinct wild-type genes. The canonical example here is BCR-ABL, which is formed when chromosome 9 and chromosome 22 and, uh, undergo a, a translocation uh, somatically, so that's uh, occurring after uh, during someone's lifetime. And uh, this is how uh, most of the gene fusions we're interested in are, are occurring, is some kind of translocation uh, in the genome that brings together two genes. In cancer, uh, gene fusions are relevant clinically because uh, a, lo a lot of, uh, there are a lot of examples of a gene fusion that uh, clinically defines a subtype of cancer. So for instance, BCR-ABL1, our example, uh, is present in 90 to 95 percent of CML patients. Uh, these uh, events are potentially targetable by drugs, and again, the example here is BCR-ABL1, which is targetable by uh, a drug called Aminotep, which is very effective at treating CML patients. Um, the, the other reason why gene fusions have become more of interest lately is because we have new methods to detect them. Uh, one thing that's not listed here is that uh, with the discovery of the ETS fusions in prostate cancer, people started to think that maybe uh, these events had implications for solid tumors, which make up the vast majority of, uh, of morbidity in terms of cancer. And so they're, they're far more important in terms of saving lives, uh, solid tumors, than leukemias, which is uh, up until say 10 years ago, where they were, uh, gene fusions were predominantly thought to occur. So what is the evidence for gene fusions as being initiators of carcinogenesis rather than just uh, passenger mutations that occur and have no effect on the phenotype of the cancer? Well, they correlate very well with cancer phenotypes, so they define subtypes of cancers. Uh, a successful treatment often results in the eradication of the fusion product from someone's uh, bloodstream. Say, for instance, in CML, if you, if you successfully treat a CML patient, then there's no more uh, translocation that's visible in their, or detectable in their blood. Gene fusions also produce uh, neoplastic disorders in mice, and if uh, we perform experiments um, in, in models where we silence gene fusions, then uh, we can reverse the tumor genesis process. There's two classes of gene fusions uh, that we like to talk about, and uh, one is a class of gene fusions where we deregulate a proto-oncogene uh, by translocating a promoter of, of a highly expressed gene uh, next to a gene that is a, a driver of cancer. So the example here is IGH uh, being translocated next to MYC, is a proto-oncogene, and the uh, IGH, uh, the IGH uh, promoter drives the expression of MYC. This, in this figure, we're just showing where the potential breakpoints can happen in MYC and IGH, and then at the bottom here we have the hybrid uh, IGH MYC gene. So the other uh, class of gene fusions is the, a fusion where more than just uh, the, the promoter region of the, the 5' prime gene 
um, is involved in the function of the fusion, in that uh, perhaps both genes are contributing functional domains. So this, the example here is, again, uh, BCR, ABL1, which is uh, BCR and ABL1 are both, uh, are both contributing uh, functional domains to the, the end product, which is this uh, fused gene. So we can look at the gene fusions that we've already discovered and try and understand what the, what the content is of this collection of genes that tends to form fusions with other genes. And a predominant group is the tyrosine kinases. Uh, these are genes that transfer a phosphate group from ATP to a protein, and they're involved in signaling, and uh, they regulate complex processes in the cell. Um, and there's some examples on the right. Transcription factors are another uh, large class of genes that form fusions. Uh, the ETS uh, genes and MYC are an example of that, and then there's also the um, proto-oncogenes, such as BCL2 and BRAF. If we, if we draw this as a network where uh, genes are connected uh, when they form fusions with each other, uh, the, they form what we call a scale-free network. Um, with the connectivity here is following a power law. So basically, the, uh, what this is saying is that uh, there's, a, there's a few guys at the party who know everyone, and then most people just came with a friend. So, uh, and they form three uh, big clusters uh, one centered around MLL, another cen centered around BCL6, um, but there's there's basically three highly connected clusters here. The genomic effects of gene fusions are important if we want to detect them. So, uh, the the first two obvious effects are chimeric DNA sequence uh, at the translocation uh, uh, boundary, where we have say a, a translocation and we the, the chimeric sequence is a sequence that's partially nine, chromosome nine, par partially chromosome 17, say. So uh, that can also result in the expression of that particular uh, breakpoint in a um, mRNA, although that doesn't always happen. Sometimes expression happens uh, downstream of where the breakpoint actually is. Uh, and then we have expression changes if we have, say, an upregulated gene. And so if we're thinking about expression, then one way the, uh, ex the expression patterns have been used to detect gene fusions is uh, where they were used, th the um, expression arrays were used to detect the ETS fusions in prostate cancer by just looking for upregulated uh, genes. And they found that ETV1 and ERG, both ETS tr transcription factors, were both highly upregulated in prostate cancer, and that they were also mutually exclusive, um, mutually exclusively upregulated. So either uh, one was upregulated or the other in different samples. Uh, and from this analysis, they were able to uh, do some uh, lab work and validate TMPRSS2 or in prostate cancer, which occurs in in over fifty percent of those tumors. Uh, this actually technique was only used once to find that fusion, and uh, after that, I don't think it's been applied since then. Um, genome sequencing is another method. The downsides here is it's uh, it's quite expensive, although it is very comprehensive, and it'll find things where we don't necessarily ex have expression of a product that is partly one chromosome and partly another. Um, but and it also doesn't give it expression information. But it was used to to identify this one fusion in colorectal adenocarcinomas. Uh, and finally, we're, what we're going to focus on mostly is uh, mRNA sequencing. And uh, this has the benefits of being quite inexpensive. It gives you information about the expression of the genes. You can use it to identify an exact fusion uh, transcript sequence. Uh, although it's not as comprehensive as genome sequencing. Um, and it was used to discover these mat mast and notch fusions in breast cancer. Um, although interestingly enough, these people have had trouble reproducing um, these uh, results, and so this is kind of pointing to 
uh, the fact that you know we're still in the infancy of identifying fusion transcripts from RNA seq. So how is uh, how is this data generated from the beginning where we have RNA molecules all the way to the end where we have sequences? First, uh, we isolate RNA by doing a pull down on anything with a poly A tail that gives us mRNA, uh, and then we do reverse transcription to get. Uh, cDNA, at this stage, we lose the information about strand. So uh, we go from single-stranded RNA to double-stranded DNA. And then we size, we fragment into uh, smaller segments, and then size-select those and do sequencing on each end. Oops. So is, is mRNA yep. sequencing the ideal platform to do fusion? Uh, discovery or you don't get the cheaper one like if you use exome sequence so exome is, an, is definitely not um, a good platform because it only samples a, a very small subset of the genome and the chances are that your, your breakpoint is gonna actually going to be an introns of uh, the two genes because the introns are the largest um, part of those genes uh, and so you won't actually identify the um, the breakpoint from exome sequencing. Uh, RNA seq definitely, I think it has the most potential for sure for identifying fusion transcripts. But again, it won't it won't identify rearrangements that uh, are still contributing some kind of gene fusion activity. Like maybe they're translocating an enhancer next to a gene that is upregulated. Something like that won't be found in RNA sequencing because uh, the translocation exists sort of almost outside of the transcriptional region of the gene that's being uh, produced, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so what, are the, what does it look like when we sequence a gene fusion uh, with RNA sequencing? Well, at the top here we have our uh, gene fusion, which is a fusion resulting from a translocation between chromosome A and B here. And uh, it results in a, a, a fusion transcript that's annotated on the top, where we have three exons of gene X and two exons of gene Y. Uh, this is transcribed into uh, this uh, messenger RNA. And then from that, we get a number of uh, RNA-seq paired end reads. And these reads we can classify into different types. So uh, I call these uh, these reads that don't have any indication of the breakpoint in them. That are basically they're all one color in this figure. Um, those are wild type reads. And then we have spanning reads, which are reads for which uh, one end is entirely from one gene and one end is entirely from another gene. And then split reads are the reads where the actual read sequence that we've sequenced on the Illumina machine. Uh, or other sequencer is uh, is partially one, uh, partially from one chromosome, partially from another chromosome. So now the problem is to take a collection of reads that look like this uh, and try and assign them to the lo original locations uh, in the reference genome that we believe that they uh, they originated from in terms of a healthy human reference. Uh, and this is, I guess, the uh, our, I would call it here the RNA alignment problem. Uh, so the problem, say, for this read is to identify which uh, location this green segment comes from uh, compared to these other orange segments. You can see that this is also, also uh, made difficult by the fact that the read on the right is split by this intron. So we have um, reads can be split by the fact that they are from multiple chromosomes due to a fusion or multiple regions within the same gene due to splicing. Yeah? Sorry, uh, how do you identify where the split is in either case? So uh, this is, yeah, that's basically the problem that I'm but trying to define, I guess. That's aside from the, from the alignment. So the alignment is... So I guess, issue. yeah, determining that alignment is the problem. And that includes determining where the split is in the read. Does that answer your question? Um, half, but how do you how do you, uh, how do you decide where this is? 
So I'll, um, maybe I'll go into that in, in the next few slides, and if you don't understand that by then, then totally ask me again. Uh, okay, so, and alternately we can, uh, since we have uh, a very good understanding of the genes and their splicing in the human genome, we can uh, just assign to uh, g the gene sequence, the mRNA sequences themselves, which makes this problem a little bit easier in that we don't have to worry about uh, splicing. Although in some cases, uh, rearrangement can induce some novel splicing. And so uh, there's a reason why we wouldn't <laughs> always want to do the, what we do on the bottom here. OK, so at this point, I mentioned, I'll mention that there's two uh, paradigms that are used for RNA-seq. One is alignment first, and the other one is uh, assembly first. I'll call them. Uh, for alignment first, we first try and find the locations of all of these reads in the, the genome uh, or transcriptome independently for each read. And then after that, we cluster uh, the reads based on their alignment in the genome uh, into, uh, into contigs, basically. Uh, conversely, we in, in assembly, we kind of do the clustering first. We try to cluster reads together that look like they're from the same uh, messenger RNA. And then after that, we, assi we align them to the reference genome to determine whether or not they come from uh, two distinct genes. And so the, the clustering in terms of assembly, if you're not familiar with assembly, it's basically about looking for a, a suffix of one uh, read that matches a prefix of another read and then stacking them up like this and so that we can build a longer sequence out of a bunch of shorter sequences. So I'm m mainly going to focus on alignment-based approaches because those are the predominant approaches that have been used for uh, gene fusion discovery in RNA-seq. Uh, in essence, the problem here gets harder as we consider uh, more and more, uh, I guess, differences within the read um, with respect to the reference. So if we have an exact uh, a sequence, a read that exactly matches our reference, this is a fairly tractable problem that we can solve easily. If there's perhaps a few mismatches or indels, small ins insertions or deletions, this gets a little bit harder. Um, and if we have non-contiguous alignments like uh, to separate chromosomes, then this gets a lot harder. The general strategy is pretty much the same for a lot of these algorithms. It's basically to take a problem that at the bottom here, the non-contiguous alignment problem, and make it, massage it until it looks like the exact aligned problem. So we uh, leverage the fact that we can solve the easier problem to solve the harder problem. Oops. So one way we can do that is to uh, change the, do something with the read sequence, and the easiest thing to do is just to split it into sections. And so say we take this read, split it into three, three parts, uh, and then if this read comes from a fusion transcript uh, in the middle, where there's a, uh, a fusion boundary in the middle, then this middle sequence won't map very well, but the, the sequence on the left and the right will map, map uh, perfectly to the, the chromosomes from which they originated. And then we can uh, after the fact, it's pretty easy to reconstruct the exact breakpoint. And the second thing we can do is, uh, based on some prior information, we can do something with the chromosome sequences. We can leave the read, read sequence alone, and we can do something with the chromosome sequences. So here, uh, if we know that a priori that there's a fusion that involves this uh, green part, the part of this green chromosome here, and this part of this red chromosome here, we can merge them together uh, approximately, and then do a, uh, a gapped alignment of our read sequence to the uh, to this sort of fabricated chromosome sequence, this, this chromosome sequence that we've uh, created with our prior knowledge. And this is an easy, easier problem. And the way we do that often is by uh, using paired in read information. So if we see a read that maps uh, with one end to one gene and the other end to another gene, 
then uh, we can say maybe there's, there's a fusion between these two genes. And we can, um, there's, a, there's basically two ways of doing this. We can either uh, take the approximate region where we think the breakpoint is on either side, put those two regions together, and try and align uh, reads to those regions in, in this way that we've described here. Or another way is people assume that uh, the fusion only occurs, the fusion boundary only occurs at an exon boundary. And then they just concatenate all of the exons together and try and align to those concatenated exons. So there's a lot of uh, fusion discovery tools uh, based on the alignment approach that have come out recently. Um, a lot of them are quite similar, uh, and they're uh, named quite similarly. Um, but yeah, basically they all do some variant of the, the stuff we've just we've just covered. Most of them give you the exact sequence. A lot of them uh, segment the reads as a, a way to deal with split reads. Uh, a lot of them leverage paired inf end information. And then a subset of them uh, use an approx approximate reference or an exon junction reference to realign split reads and, and re recover those split reads. I'm not going to talk too much about assembly-based tools, um, although we are going to, we're going to try and uh, do some assembly of some fusion transcripts in the lab. Um, there's a couple good options, Transibus and, and Trinity. Trinity is pretty good because it gives you full-length uh, fusion transcripts, whereas Transibus just gives you the, uh, the sequence at the fusion boundary, which is often difficult to take and map back to the genome. Um, and then what you, after you have the contigs, you can use something like GMAP, which is a really nice contig aligner, or a dissect, also a contig aligner, or Barnacle does a little bit more in terms of uh, it actually does the annotation for you. So based on some evaluations, Chimera Scan, Top Hat Fusion, and Diffuse are um, among the top most sensitive ones, and we're going to run all three of those in the lab. Uh, Diffuse is, is my own creation. Um, and so the, the other thing I would mention is that results from simulations are, are not really very reliable at distinguishing these tools' performance in real data. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Is there anything that's very different between the fusions and just an insertion? Like um, so are you talking about a novel insertion of completely unknown so sequence? Um, well, I mean, if you, if the insertion contains, if the inserted product contains a gene, then just, I guess by semantics, we call it uh, a gene fusion if it, especially if it produces mRNA that is from two genes, one of them from the inserted uh, sequence. So. So is it then just on the functional side of it? Like, is it just because we know that it came from two genes, we care about this as a particular class? insertions or are there certain features that make so need to answer your question I think it's you have you have to re recall back to your starting material mm -hmm. for this experiment is is messenger is messenger RNA or an RNA population and not DNA so you're already looking at something that is moving forward to make be made into a protein and so it is falling into a, a different so I guess if you, if you have a piece of a chromosome that maybe doesn't have any genes inserted somewhere else in the genome, that happens a lot. Uh, and it happens a lot that that gets transcribed. Maybe there's a promoter uh, that's inserted uh, somewhere else next to, next to just garbage sequence, intron sequence or something like this. So you'll get something that's expressed. Is that a gene fusion? Um, I guess it's, it's kind of semantics, right? It's, it's it's not in the strictest sense in terms of creating either a um, highly expressed proto-oncogene or a chimeric 
um, functional gene. So is it just a semantic difference then? There's no sort of features of gene fusions that are that make them easier or harder to detect that we should have to No, no not in terms part. of detection. I don't think there's a there's a, that much difference. Because I mean, we could, in the example I just gave, we could have a an insertion of say a promoter into a region that doesn't have any known gene sequence, but perhaps there is something there that's relevant to the cancer. Uh, maybe it's a non-coding RNA that's unannotated or something. So, anyway. So will your fusion programs call general insertions and then you filter it out to say um, this is actually part of So often they're, uh, some of them are based entirely on just restricting to the known set of genes, and then some of them uh, align also to the genome and, and the transcriptome, so there's the possibility of finding sort of, uh, I call them expressed rearrangements, but yeah, for a better word. Yeah, so uh, I guess I don't think of it in terms of, generally, I, you know, it's good to give an example in terms of different chromosomes, but uh, really these, these can be any two regions of the genome that are, are somehow pulled together to bring two genes together, whether they're inverted or it, it doesn't matter. So um, you tried to say that a gene fusion is a particular type of translocation, uh, or a translocation is a particular type of gene fusion? I, I would say it's more a type of rearrangement. Whether it produces a gene fusion is depends on whether the, the translocation breakpoints occur within genes or okay. close to genes. Yeah. What about the distance of the boundaries? Because in terms of particular ins insertions, they're usually, they tend to be pretty small. They're very large. It's hard to detect them. And yeah. gene fusions, I guess, they, they rely on very, uh, they, they connect very distant parts of the genome. So yeah. Is this correct? So, I guess it depends on your definition of insertion, right? Like if you're talking, you, I guess you're talking about small insertions, um, which couldn't be gene fusions. These have to be very long segments, like gene size segments that are being moved around in the genome by rearrangement. Yeah, mostly insertions are small. A couple bases, one codon to uh, six codons. That's the difference between them. Yeah. If you're thinking about insertions, they tend to be small. If well, there's very, very large, it's completely different than that in terms of. I think you can classify. Uh, so there's small insertions, and we can just call them small insertions and big insertions, right? Like, there's the TMPRSS2 ERG gene is actually a um, insertion of one loci into another, um, but it's an, an insertion of a segment that's the size of a gene. So, um, yeah. You mentioned before that there are a couple promiscuous fusion partners. Yep. Is there any consistency in the fusion, where the fusion junction? I actually have a slide on that. Um, do you want to wait until I get to it? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. So in terms of what kind of false positives we're going to see, there's two um, ways in the, which these are produced. Uh, one is the technical stuff like alignment artifacts uh, that are produced when we have homologous sequence and we don't can't precisely align uh, these sequences to the, the reference genome. Or uh, the other problem that occurs is we have high expression of some, very high expression of some genes, like our, our ribosomal RNA. Uh, and a small amount of read errors in the, those uh, sequences that come from those highly expressed genes will mean that those genes might map to somewhere else in the, um, in the genome and will produce artifacts. Uh, we also get biological technical artifacts, like uh, chimeric reads, which happen uh, for these two reasons. When we're doing the reverse transcriptase, they can template switch, and we get a chimeric read um, produced from two different mRNA. And then we can get lig ligation artifacts. These are usually randomly dispersed, which helps us in uh, removing them. And then also, also, in terms of biological artifacts, there's natural sources of rearrangement, like uh, germline rearrangements, Ig rearrangements. And, uh, and a, a very important one is uh, transcription-induced chimeras, which if you look at any of the results of these uh, fusion discovery programs, you'll see a lot of these in some types of cancers, 
where basically you have uh, what is pretty much alternative splicing between, from one gene to its neighboring gene. Um, so solutions for the first problem of alignment artifacts are ones we can solve. This is a problem we can uh, try to solve computationally. Uh, what we did, did in the diffuse paper is we defined a set of features of these alignments and then trained a classifier. And uh, uh, that's, that's the, like, one approach. And a, another very common approach is just to apply filters. So I'll quickly go through the uh, features that we found to be the most significant. Um, the first one here is refers to how well uh, when we've reconstructed our, our fusion transcript sequence, how well the, the reads distribute across the fusion boundary. If we have them all stacking up together in the same location and just con contributing only a small amount of sequence on one side, um, this, this sequence that is a uh, smaller sequence on this one blue side of the, of the sequence of the fusion transcript here is often called an anchor, because it anchors one side of the, the fusion to the other. So if this is quite small, um, and they all stack up in the same place, that's a pretty good sign it's uh, false positive. And that's what we see in this histogram, uh, where we have green are uh, positives and red are negatives, and we can see that this feature of how well these distribute is separating the, the false positives from the true, net, true positives. Uh, another good feature, and this is a feature that determine, that gets, helps us get rid of alignment artifacts, and also the ligation and uh, reverse transcriptase artifacts, is just to look at the boundary of the, fu uh, the fusion transcript in one gene and in the other, and see if there's a canonical splicing signal, which is uh, generally in 99% of the genes, it's GTAG is how most genes are spliced. Uh, and so if we see that splicing signal, then that's uh, a good sign that the translocation happened in uh, um, the intron of both genes, which is the most likely thing to have happened, and that the resulting uh, translocated chromosome spliced out uh, that whole uh, new intron sequence. And then we can see here that uh, this large mass on the right of green of the positives is showing that uh, it, we have a match here for the GTIG signal, and the, um, the red negatives are just kind of a uh, random match to GTIG. Uh, the next feature is just how well these we are able to map each side of these uh, paired end reads. If we see maybe one or two alignments on either side for the, the paired end reads, then that's okay. But if one side of this fusion transcript maps to many different places, then that's uh, giving us information about how ambiguous uh, this prediction is. Another quite prevalent feature is if we reconstruct the fusion transcript uh, and look at the, how the supporting reads align to that new fusion transcript, uh, we can ask the question how uh, do those reads that align to the fusion transcript look s the same in terms of their parameters as the uh, alignments to just regular wild type genes? And for instance, one of the things that we can look at is uh, how far apart each end maps from each other. And if the distance is around the same as what we expect, given that we have we can align to all of the wild type. Uh, genes with the wild type reads, then we can say that we have confidence in those reads. Finally, how well do um, the previous feature was split reads, now how well do the spanning reads align to the fusion transcript? And then the last one is, um, do we have any homology uh, or in the region of the breakpoint? So here on the left, in this part of the figure, um, if you can see where the mouse is pointing. Uh, we have each side of this uh, predicted fusion transcript maps to uh, the gene to which it's predicted to have um, come from, and only that portion of the sequence. Whereas on the right here, 
uh, the part that we've predicted as coming from gene A plus a little bit of the part that we've predicted coming from gene B, or, or maybe even more um, in especially bad fusion calls, uh, can be mapped to gene B. So in essence, we have this region at the fusion boundary that can be mapped equally well to gene A and gene B, and that's showing us that this is probably an alignment artifact. So in terms of biological artifacts, uh, one of the things we can do is look for that GTAG signal. We can also uh, screen uh, against existing databases, um, such as repeat masker, uh, NumT, nuclear mitochondrial insertions, uh, Ig uh, rearrangements are, are prevalent, so we maybe we want to get rid of anything that is between two Ig genes. Uh, and finally, um, transcript read-throughs or transcription-induced chimeras are pretty easily identified because they're between adjacent genes. Once we have a set of candidates we're confident in, how do we prioritize them? Well, we can look for stuff that's highly expressed, uh, where perhaps there's interruption in the expression uh, profile across the gene uh, compared to what we expect the wild type expression to be. We can look for recurrence of either the pair of genes or uh, one, of the, one of the genes, especially if it's uh, seen as rearranged in other cancers. We can look for corroborating rearrangement if we have any information about the, the genome, such as whole genome sequencing, or if we have copy number data, then we can look for a trans uh, transition in copy number somewhere in the genes. Uh, we can also look at the gene's function. Is it a kinase? Uh, is it previously Im implicated in cancer? Could it serve as a drug target? And we can look at the, whether the function is preserved by the fusion. And one important aspect of this is whether or not the reading frame is preserved for both genes. Here's an example where we identified uh, two gene fusions that are we have a lot of confidence in just by looking at uh, the position of the breakpoint relative to the expression across the gene. Uh, and so for this ER3 CRAD fusion, uh, the expression pretty much stops after about uh, 4,500 nucleotides into this mRNA sequence. And that happens to coincide exactly with the breakpoint. Same with this gene on the bottom here. Um, and so this means that we can do an expression analysis on our fusion transcripts as a way of maybe having more confidence or calculating the expression of the fusion transcript for one, but also eliminating false positives uh, as ones that are maybe have zero expression. The caveat here is, of course, if you have a balanced rearrangement. Say you have CMKLR1, HNF1A, and you also have HNF1A, CMLRK1, which does happen. If you have those two uh, fusion transcripts, then there's not, the, not really anything, you, it's unidentifiable uh, where the reads are coming from. Okay, so in terms of prioritizing, we can also look at whether or not our fusion partner is recurrent across multiple cancer types. So BRAF, for instance, is translocated in uh, a lot of different tumor types, which would have evaded our, us if, uh, if we just looked at one cohort. Um, what we also see here is it's also translocated in very similar ways, uh, in ways that preserve this last uh, protein kinase region at the end of the BRAF gene. So when we look at uh, uh, another way of prioritizing these is, is basically to look at whether or not the, the genes, the relative gene position, whether or not that it could be a read-through. Uh, read-throughs are quite prevalent, as we see in this, basically on this, on the left here, uh, we're showing a number of inter- and intra-chromosomal rearrangements, and then a number of read-through events. And then this matrix with, uh, shows tissue by rearrangement uh, presence. And then there's a histogram on the right of the information, of the same information, and it's just showing that the only thing that's really recurrent here uh, out of all of these events is TMPSS2 erg, and then there's a whole number of gene fusions that are pretty much only in one sample. 
and this can be contrasted to the read-throughs, which are uh, often found in many, many samples. Um, and I'm just going to skip this uh, image on the right. So we don't want to completely rule out uh, read-through events because some of them have been found to be interesting. For instance, this particular read-through in prostate cancer has been found as uh, very important for this for the disease, as it regulates prostate cancer uh, proliferation. And, and uh, what we also know about this is it's it's tissue specific. It's very specific to uh, prostate, but it's also it, and it, that tissue specificity basically comes from the fact that um, SLC forty five A three, the five prime gene and the gene that that would be um, contributing the promoter, that is itself is prostate specific. Finally, we can uh, look at where the, the fusion boundary exists in the uh, gene model. And so on the left, we have different possibilities for connecting these exons with a gene fusion. And uh, the most common for uh, read-throughs is the second to last exon of the 5' prime gene and the, the second exon of the uh, 3' prime gene although there's a, a lot of read-throughs have other patterns. Predominantly, the, that's not the predominant pattern for interchromosomal and intrachromosomal rearrangements. Uh, they, most, they can have any distribution of exons and introns, or exons that are fused from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And so the, the other thing in, in thinking about function is whether or not our protein sequence is the, the, the sequence of the mRNA that's getting it translated is uh, is actually going to produce a a chimeric protein where the five prime uh, set of codons and the three prime set of codons are, are both going to be preserved in the resulting uh, fusion protein uh, if if our fusion comes together in a in a specific way then uh, these codons, obviously, if, if it happens at a codon boundary, if the fusion boundary happens at a codon boundary, then the 5' prime codon sequence and the 3' prime codon sequence will both exist in the resulting protein. Uh, even if they don't come together at a, a boundary, but um, they come together in a specific way, then we can maybe only, maybe there will only be uh, one nonsense codon. If they come together uh, in any other way, then the downstream the three prime protein sequence will just be nonsense. And so this is easily computable and then can be used to assess whether or not three prime protein sequence is uh, relevant. So finally, we can, uh, this is from some of my own work where we looked at the corresponding rearrangements that we're producing gene fusions in prostate cancer. And this is a particularly complex case where we had um, two fusion transcripts we were interested in. This, uh, they're highlighted here on the, the right, this red and blue transcript and this yellow and green transcript. One is involving Shank2 and one involving Mick. Uh, and we found that they were produced by this complex event where uh, three chromosomes at four loci were brought together and simultaneously translocated uh, to produce four, uh, four breakpoints, and this simultaneously produced these two uh, fusion transcripts. Um, and uh, the second thing we did in this paper is we looked at uh, whether or not we could identify complex breakpoints where it's not necessarily just one chromosome uh, loci translocated and fused to another uh, chromosomal loci. And in, in many cases, um, in this particular cancer type, the breakpoint was more complex than we expected. And so, for example, here, uh, the breakpoint involved one KB insertion and another one KB insertion at the breakpoint. So this, if you're, if you're trying to discover gene fusions from 
full genome sequencing, this has implications because you would only be able to detect these independent breakpoints. You would basically detect all three of these breakpoints, and you wouldn't be able to piece together necessarily that uh, SAMD12 was fused to this uh, PHF 20L1 gene producing a fusion transcript. Okay, so just to finish up a few uh, considerations when we're thinking about uh, designing an experiment. So with a large cohort size, uh, sometimes your computational costs can be pretty prohibitive with applying some of these methods, but uh, often um, you can leverage the fact that if you have a large cohort size, you could look for things that are recurrent can be um, often classified as highly recurrent. So say 90% can often be classified as uh, artifacts. And so a lot of the, even though we're in some cases we're looking for something that's highly recurrent because we want something that defines the disease, uh, most of those are actually going to be something that we can filter out. And so if we're smart about filtering things that are recurrent, then we can often uh, use that to hone down on things that are real. Yeah, this is very unique, uh, definitely. I think there's a lot of... So what we're finding in, in prostate cancer is that uh, TMPRESS has two ERG, and, and those fusions are in 50%, and then there's a whole catalog of uh, fusions that happen in a very small subset of cases um, that are unique to each specific tumor that may still have implications. For instance, this uh, translocation here produces a upregulated uh, gene in, in the same way that it does in Burkitt's lymphoma. It's actually in the same entron of MYC. And so it's relevant to this particular patient, but not necessarily to the cancer in general, because we've only seen it once. Yeah. Uh, and so finally here, uh, if we if we have a, are do, doing an experiment where we suspect that we have a set of fusions partners um, that we want to understand what they're fusing to, then we can do something like targeted capture instead of RNA seq. Um, and so I'll finish up just with this uh, sort of good news story. I've, even though this problem is hard, um, there is a definite reason to continue uh, to find these fusions, uh, even if, and I think that in the future, these fusions, as I kind of alluded to, uh, will be quite rare but still relevant. And then if this is an example where we found EML4K ALK in um, lung cancer in only 5% approximately of lung cancer cases, so it's not very prevalent. But now we have a drug that has just completed uh, phase 3 trials, which can be used to treat it. And that's it for the lecture. <coughs>